chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita. The, uh, see if I have the Sanskrit title. I do not. <clears throat> I mean, I can find it easy, but I don't feel like looking for it. Um, let me get this microphone near me so you can hear me, hopefully. And where are we? We are chapter 11, the cosmic vision. In this chapter, Krishna reveals... I want to say his true form to Arjuna, uh, but even that sort of, it's the true form as Arjuna can still perceive it, which is still sort of too much for Arjuna to handle. Um, but anyway, chapter 11 with uh, a little bit of commentary by me, probably, and I'll finish it off with some commentary from Gandhi. And I just want to check this out real fast. All right, that has nothing to do with me. Boom. So chapter 11 begins with Arjuna. Out of compassion, you have taught me that the supreme mystery of the self. Sorry, out of compassion, you have taught me the supreme mystery of the soul. Through your words, my delusion is gone. You have explained the origin and the end of every creature, O Lotus-Eyed One, and told me of your own supreme limitless existence. Just as you have described your infinite glory, O Lord, now I long to see it. I want to see you as the supreme ruler of creation. O Lord, Master of Yoga, if you think me strong enough to behold it, show me your immortal self. Krishna. Behold, Arjuna, a million divine forms with an infinite variety of color and shape. Behold the gods of the natural world and many more wonders never, never revealed before. Behold the entire cosmos turning within my body and the other things you desire to see. But these things cannot be seen with your physical eyes. Therefore, I give you spiritual vision to perceive my majestic power. Reminds me of that story in the Old Testament where um, I, I, I don't remember the, the, the whole context, but I remember there was uh, a couple of prophets. One was either Elijah or Elisha, and there was this army on the other side, and one of the prophets or one of the figures was, was feeling very... Uh, dismayed by the fact their army was so small uh, compared to the enemy's armies and uh, and the prophet I what I I'm pretty sure it was either Elijah or Elisha I can't remember which one um, asked the Lord to re, re, to open his spiritual eyes so that the person could see that there was this huge divine army fighting on their side so um, that person who was dismayed could see through spiritual vision this large, overwhelming army provided by heaven that was also on their side that looked invisible to physical eyes but could be seen with spiritual eyes. Same thing here. Um, Arjuna cannot see Krishna in his true form with physical eyes. Therefore, Krishna gives him the ability to look at him with spiritual, with spiritual eyes. Sanjaya, who is sort of narrating this to the king, if you remember. Remember, this whole conversation is taking place. Um, the, the king, the blind king, is uh, on his throne, and he says to Sanjaya, tell me what's happening, and through his sort of special yogic powers given to him, was able to sort of see the battle and describe the battle to the king even though he was far away and he could overhear this conversation even though he's far away. So now Sanjaya jumps in. Having, having, yeah. Having spoken these words, Krishna, the master of yoga, <clears throat> revealed to Arjuna his most exalted lordly form. He appeared with an infinite number of faces ornamented by heavenly jewels displaying unending miracles and countless weapons of his power. Clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet-smelling and heavy, heavenly fragrances, 
clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet smelling with heavenly fragrance, fragrances, he showed himself as the infinite Lord, the source of all wonders, whose face is everywhere. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that supreme spirit. There within the body of the God of gods, Arjuna saw all the manifold forms of the universe united as one. Filled with amazement, his hair standing on end in ecstasy, he bowed before the Lord with joined palms and spoke these words. Arjuna. O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere without beginning, middle, or end. You are the Lord of all creation, and the cosmos is your body. You wear a crown and carry a mace and discus. Your radiance is blinding and immeasurable. I see you who are so difficult to behold, shining like a fiery sun blazing in every direction. You are the supreme changes for reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle, or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warns, I'm sorry, your radiance warms the cosmos. O oh Lord, your presence fills the heavens and the earth and reaches in every direction. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision of your wonderful and terrible form. The gods enter your being, some calling out and greeting you in fear. Great saints sing your glory, praying may all be well. The multitudes of gods, demigods, and demons are all overwhelmed by the sight of you. O mighty Lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths, arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. O Vishnu, I can see your shining eyes, and with open mouth your glitter, you glitter in an array of colors, and your body touches the sky. I look at you, and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning like the fires at the end of time, I forgot where I, I forget where I am and have no and have no place to go. O oh Lord, you are the support of the universe, have mercy on me. I see all the sons of Dhritarashtra, that's the blind king. I see Bhishma, Drona, and Karna. I see our warriors and all the kings who are here to fight. All are rushing into your awful jaws. I see them, I see some of them crushed by your teeth. As rivers flow into the oceans, all the warriors of this world are passing into your fiery jaws. All creatures rush to their destruction like moths into a flame. You lap the worlds, you lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole of creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord of terrible form. I bow before you. Have mercy. I want to know who you are, you who existed before all creation. Your nature and workings confound me. Krishna, I am time, the destroyer of all worlds. That is the uh, line that Oppenheimer, if you remember the story of Oppenheimer when the atomic bomb was invented and they tested it, Oppenheimer, the inventor, uh, the old translation used to say, um, I am become death, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds or the eater of worlds. 
Uh, somewhere along the way, they decided the better translation, and this appears in more of the, all the modern ones, is Krishna says, I am time, the destroyer of all. I have come to consume the world. Even without your participation, all the warriors gathered here will die. And that's true. Everybody's going to die. Therefore, arise, Arjuna, conquer your enemies, and enjoy the glory of sovereignty. I have already slain all these warriors. You will only be my instrument. Bhishma, Drona, Jaidratha, Karna, and many others are already slain. Kill those whom I have killed. Do not hesitate. Fight in this battle, and you will conquer your enemies. Sanjaya, the uh, narrator, speaks. Having heard these words, Arjuna trembled in fear. With joined palms, he bowed before Krishna and addressed him, stammering, and Arjuna speaks. O Krishna, it is right that the world delights and rejoices in your praise, and that all saints and sages bow down to you, and all evil flees before you to the far corners of the universe. How could they not worship you, O Lord? You are the eternal spirit who existed before Brahma, the creator, and who will never cease to be. Lord of the gods, you are the abode of the universe. Changeless, you are what is and what is not, and beyond the duality of existence and non-existence. You are the first among gods, the timeless spirit, the resting place of all beings. You are the knower and the thing which is known. You are the final home, and your infinite, with your infinite form you pervade the cosmos. You are Vayu. You are Vayu, god of wind, Yama, god of death, Agni, god of fire, Varuna, god of water. You are the moon and the creator Prajapati, and the great grandfather of all creatures. I bow before you and salute you again and again. You are behind me and in front of me. I bow to you on every side. Your power is immeasurable. You pervade everything. You are everything. Sometimes because we were friends, I rashly said, Oh, Krishna, say friend. Casual, careless remarks. Whatever I may have said lightly, whether we were playing or resting, alone or in company, sitting together or eating, if it was disrespectful, forgive me for it, O oh Krishna. I did not know the greatness of your nature unchanging and imperishable. You are the father of the universe, of the animate and the inanimate. You are the object of all worship, the greatest guru. There is none to equal you in the three worlds. Who can match your power? O oh, gracious Lord, I, prost I prostrate myself before you and ask for your blessing. As a father forgives his son, or a friend a friend, or a lover his beloved, so should you forgive me. I rejoice in seeing you as you have never been seen before. Yet I am filled with fear by this vision of you as the abode of the universe. Please let me see you again as the shining God of gods. Please let me see you again as the shining God of gods. Though you are the embodiment of all creation, let me see you again, not with a thousand arms, but with four, carrying the mace and discus and wearing a crown. Basically, the way I read that, the divine form of Krishna is too much for Arjuna to handle. So he begs him to sort of dial it back, right? So he wants to see Krishna as God, but he saw Krishna as sort of absolute, and it was too much. So he's like, dial it back, so let me see you as God, but not so much as God. Which strikes me as a very human response. Krishna speaks, Arjuna, though my, through my grace you have been united with me and received this vision of my radiant universal form without beginning or end, which no one else has ever seen. Not by knowledge of the Vedas, nor sacrifices, nor charity, nor rituals, nor even by severe asceticism, has any other mortal seen what you have seen, O heroic Arjuna. 
Do not be troubled. Do not fear my terrible form. Let your heart be satisfied and your fears dispelled in looking at me as I was before. Sanjaya narrates, Having spoken these words, the Lord once again assumed the gentle form of Krishna and consoled his devotee, who had been so afraid. Arjuna, O Krishna, now that I have seen your gentle human form, my mind is again composed and I and return to normal. Krishna, it is extremely difficult to obtain the vision you have had. Even the gods long even the gods long always to see me in this aspect. Neither knowledge of the Vedas nor austerity nor charity nor sacrifice can bring the vision you have seen. But through unfailing devotion, Arjuna, you can know me, see me, and attain union with me. Those who make me the supreme goal of all their work and act without selfish attachment, who devote themselves to me completely and are free from ill will for any creature, enter into me. I'm going to read that sentence again, or that verse again, or that shloka again. Those who make me the supreme goal of all their work and act without selfish attachment, who devote themselves to me completely and are free from ill will for any creature, enter into me. And that is chapter 11. So let me bounce over here to, oh, wrong button. Bounce over here to Gandhi. Boom. Oh, I'm in chapter 2. Let's go to chapter 11. Uh, just scanning through some of the things Gandhi is saying. He says, this cosmic form includes good and evil. Hindus and Muslims, believers and atheists, all. You may also see, this quoting Krishna saying, you may also see, Sri Krishna adds, anything else you wish to see. Because all means all and includes everything. Like we, I grew up with people always telling me that God is everywhere, but then they set out to always seem to define where God is not. And if God is everywhere, God is even in those people that you hate, right? God is there too, because if God is not there, then God is not everywhere. Having be bequeathed divine sight, the Supreme Lord exhibited his almighty, omnipotent, transient, Visharupa, universal manifestation. The teaching of the Gita were not meant to be merely preserved in a book. They are meant to be translated into action. How will this knowledge profit us if we merely take down notes and do not put the teaching into practice? We should therefore serve the people among whom we live and help our elders in the doing of their domestic chores. The whole universe with its manifold divisions was gathered there in him like the like a tree and its leaves this is good the whole universe with its manifold divisions was gathered there in him him being krishna like a tree and its leaves the tree is like the cosmic form of the lord the root and the leaves being one the root and the leaves being one. The root contains the whole world of the tree. And the leaves represent that world divided into many forms. So, if all of creation is the tree, the root is God. Well, the whole tree is God. But in its sort of, when it, back in its sort of source form... The root is God, but there's no distinction in the end between the leaves and the root because both are necessary. 
but there's many, many leaves, and that's like all of us. There's many, many creatures, but it's all still connected to that tree, the branches and the tree and the trunk, which leads to the root. There is no division between the root and the leaves. It's just, it's all one tree. Arjuna could clearly see manifested within the universal form of all creation. Arjuna could clearly see manifest within the universal form all of creation with its unlimited and with its unlimited and uh, uh, varied details from the powerful Brahman to the humble blade of grass. Thus Arjuna saw the cosmic form of the God of Gods. On the one hand, Arjuna says that Sri Krishna has a definite form, and on the other hand, he says that he is formless. In other words, his form is so vast that in truth, he is formless. Arjuna is wonderstruck at the image of Sri Krishna he sees bearing a crown and holding mace and disc in each hand and a mass of radiance glowing from his body. He is as lustrous as fire and the sun and dazzling in the sight be, because he is immeasurable because of his immeasurable effulgence. The sun gives us some faint idea of the Lord's light, but it is no more than a dim point of light in comparison with the Lord's. He has placed the sun at such a great distance from us. What would have been our condition if he had been if it had, what would be our condition if it had been a little nearer? Can we then imagine Arjuna's condition with Sri Krishna standing near him, glowing with the light of a thousand suns? Just skipping through some stuff here. Comforting Arjuna, Sri Krishna tells him that he should not be bewildered or fearful of his Vish, Vishra, Vishvarupa, his absolute form, even in all its terrifying splendor. For now, he would reveal his more familiar four-armed visage. Because Vishnu has four arms. Seeing his four-armed form, and then again, his more gentle two-armed visage, Arjuna's tranquility is restored, and he becomes composed. And explaining the extraordinary grace he had bestowed on Arjuna, Sri Krishna declares that his idiom rump rupam, the two armed, uh, is pure, spiritual, and rarely seen. I just missed my mouth. All right, two little more comments from Gandhi of this chapter. He says, first, we should know that the Lord, first we should know the Lord, then see him, and then merge into him, is what Krishna was saying at the end. We may tell him, you may eat me up, I will not resist if you do, I am yours, and I want to be one with you. What harm can it do even if you eat me up? Telling us that he can grind us into paste with his teeth and throw it out, he tells us that we can know him through back through bhakti with through devotion we can pass we can pass his test only through faith when we know that everything takes place through him and that he lives and and that when we know that everything takes place through him and that we live and die as he wills how can we be affected by anything 
And then the last comment Gandhi has as commentary on this chapter for the, like, the last verse. Um, and I'll give you Gandhi's translation just sort of remind you. He says, He alone comes to me, O Pandava, that's Arjuna, who does my work, who has made me his goal, who is my devotee and has renounced attachment, who has ill will towards none. The Lord has given the whole substance of chapter 11 in this last verse. He who works for me is, is ever devoted to me, who is attached to nothing and bears ill will to, to none, not even to a person who may have committed a heinous, not even to a person who may have committed a heinous sin, but ever blesses him instead. Such a person comes to me. I'm going to read that again. The Lord has given the whole substance of chapter 11 in this last verse. He who works for me is ever devoted to me, who is attached to nothing and bears ill will toward none, not even the person who may have committed heinous sin, but ever blesses him instead. Such a person comes to me. Which is something Christians should like. Well, in theory, they should like it because Jesus says something like that, but they don't like it because they like to ignore Jesus. Um, they, they want what Jesus can do for them, but they really don't want to do what Jesus tells them to do. Uh, sorry, that was may have been cynical. Uh, but prove me wrong, Christians. Prove me wrong. Um, so there we go. Chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita with some commentary, very little by me because as Arjuna, Arjuna put in all the commentary, what he saw, and he's using his poetic language to try and explain this universal form of Krishna, which is everything, even the gods, all the gods are in Krishna, everything is in Krishna, this divine form, or this Brahman, uh, and then Gandhi sort of take on it. I like the Gandhi take because they're usually very practical, you know, not all egghead esoteric stuff, but it's like, how do we live this? What do we do with this? Um, so, all of chapter 11, I guess the takeaway is to remember, be devoted to God, whatever you form your God is. God as you understand God. Uh, work to serve that God. Have no ill will toward any living creature. To me, that means not eating meat and stuff too, but you know, whatever, work it out in your own life. Um, and you will go to God. You will become one with God is the promise at the end of that chapter. So thank you for, uh, for spending some time with me in the Bhagavad Gita, and I'll see you later. I honor the divinity within you. Hari Om Tat Sat.